by dt squared, maybe make this equation 12.3, uh, and del squared a, same equation again and again, 1 over c squared d2a by dt squared, so 12.4, let me just move these boards up so we've got the whole set uh, together. If we use the so-called Lorentz gauge, and uh, say so this will be more mentioned in passing here for the sake of completeness if you want to go on, which is that del dot A is equal to, <coughs> excuse me, minus 1 over C squared D2 phi by DT squared. Let's make the Lorentz gauge here, equation 12.5. So, I'll say this is a, a topic that we're going to uh, um, uh, skate over a little bit. But the complete expression for the electric field is here, now minus dA by dt. And so you can see that this is a very concise way of always, it, and, and you can see, I hope you can see that now, you see this term was electrostatics, but when we allow the curl of E to be minus dB by dt, Clearly, if we look at just Faraday's law and we're expressing the uh, B field in this way, then, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sort of getting used to the, the chalk dust again, that uh, this equation becomes that the curl of E is equal to minus D by DT of the curl of A. Yeah, and so if the curl of this vector field is always equal to the curl of this vector field, we've got that E is minus dA by dt. We can express it in this way. So if you like, the dynamic magnetic field contribution to e, the E field is expressed as a minus dA by dt term. The part of the electric field which is produced by static charges first Maxwell equation we can express in this way and so this gives the general expression for the electric field. This is already general because we've already built in precisely that del dot b is equal to zero and um, there is this particular uh, section of the VLE which gives you um, this idea of a gauge theory. And I'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. But everything, basically, if we make this choice of what's called the Lorentz gauge, the electric field, the magnetic field, the electric potential, the vector potential, everything in free space satisfies this wave equation. And because of that, because everything satisfies this wave equation, I'm going to essentially abbreviate Again, let's move all these up so we've got the whole lot at one go. Because everything satisfies this wave equation, in all the components of everything satisfy this wave equation, or d2 psi by, uh, sorry, I'll write it again in full vector form, del squared phi is 1 over c squared times um, d to psi by dt squared, where psi can represent either the three compose any of the, excuse me, any of the three components. of the E field or the B field or phi or A. So Maxwell's equations in free space give us this very 
beautiful symmetry that everything obeys the same wave equation. And so uh, we can um, look at the whole of the um, Maxwell equations in free space as a very beautiful uh, set of wave equations. So, again, this is more a, a recap. I went through this calculation um, in a different way because I think, again, if you like, that's the pure math. If, you, if you're asked to say, prove that Maxwell's equations in free space give a three-dimensional wave, the way to do it is the way to take the curl of the curl of the field, to eliminate the other field, and prove that you get a wave equation from that. However, I wanted to motivate it a little bit more, it, root it, if you like, in reality of what that means geometrically by doing the example of actually just assuming, with no additional assumptions, and again, this uh, maybe caused a bit of confusion, but... Uh, it's easier, and in optics, we're going to do plane wave approximations just to make the maths easier. So that exactly, if I shake, if you imagine you know, like this whole thing, I shake a board down and it's charged and there's a, a, a corresponding sheet of opposite charge behind it so there's no electrical effects, and then I shake it back up again, I send out these electromagnetic waves. And that's what's represented here in the figure 48, is that I have a whole sheet of charge which is given some kind of kick. And that gives... Uh, we have to... Actually, solving the whole of Maxwell's equations, not in free space, but when you've got a combination of the type of solutions that we've learned for electrostatics and magnetostatics with the wave-like solutions of free space. There's, of course, an intermediate regime where you're neither really close to the sources and the sort of, if you like, what you've learned last year, those types of solutions of steady-state magnetism or static electricity apply. If you're very far away, the wave sort of equations will apply. In the intermediate regime, it is actually more difficult. Again, that was one of the topics of this electromagnetic theory course. And if you want to pursue that, you can look up what are called the lienard vickert potentials. That is a mathematical machine for solving the Maxwell equations everywhere. But we're going to stick with the free space approximation. However, of course, you do have to have a source to get the fields moving in the first place. You'll appreciate that uh, you have to do that. And I think we, we sort of justified in some intuitive way that the B field in this case, if I produce a current by kicking a whole sheet of charge upwards, points to the left. And again, putting in a bit of intuition, you can imagine that if we shake the charge up and down, the E field will also shake up and down. And so the three directions, the direction of propagation of the wave in the X direction, the magnetic field here in the Z direction, and the E field oscillating in the Y direction is uh, a natural solution to the problem. And then we analysed it in two ways. First, by looking, uh, if you like, along, back along the Z axis, and uh, we got one criterion. And again, I'd, because I wasn't making any board notes, and that, you know, it's the biggest calculation of the course, I'm going to um, make a little bit of a recap of this calculation as well. So, the, um, if you like, we can attempt to understand... And again, this kind of intuitive, I think in, in a lot of ways, using both your pure math skills and your intuition at the same time is a very powerful way of understanding the physics. We can attempt to understand Maxwell's unification theory. This, of, uh, I should say, is a later invention due to Feynman, this calculation, uh, by considering... And it's just to make the maths easier and to give everything a, a nice sort of pictorial representation of the waves by considering the simple situation where a sheet of charge is set in motion parallel to itself.
And again, if we take this analogy of kicking one of a charged blackboard up and down, we have the Y and the Z axes as the plane. And because it's like if you have a complete sheet of charge, it can only send an electric field out in that one direction because we've got complete symmetry in the YZ plane. Here, we've got an infinite sheet of charge being moved and so the wave can only head out in one direction, in the X direction. And that makes everything easier to see geometry. I will consider spherical waves um, on Monday next week and I should warn you that that is uh, definitely a red trouser, red shirt, red jacket kind of, uh, kind of day. And that, again, was one of the topics that linked with the, uh, the EM theory course and used to be part of that. We're only going to do it in a very qualitative way. Uh, and you'll, you'll understand why when we attack that uh, problem on... Um, on Monday. So, but the infinite sheet, this calculation is illustrated in figure uh, 48 of the course handout. And although it's a simple calculation, this special case shows all the main features of electromagnetic waves. It's a very good sort of example calculation because although it's a particularly simple case all the features of elect main features so I say we've got uh, the there are some differences when we drive charge up and down an antenna which of, of course you know like our radio masts have antennas they're not infinite sheets we don't oscillate charge in an infinite sheet we op oscillate it up and down a wire um, but this still shows all the main features and these three main features that should be etched on your mind are first the two vectors E and B are perpendicular to each other again you might have learnt these as rules before anyway but I'm going to emphasise these three features. So first, we've got the two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Second, and this is true again for all electromagnetic waves, not just this example calculation, the two vectors E and B are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So, they're not only mutually perpendicular, in that plane wave case, it goes nicely that they go exactly along the Cartesian axes. There's my E field, there's my B field, sorry, excuse me, there's the direction of propagation, the X, there's the direction of the magnetic field oscillations, Y, there's the direction of the electric field, oscillations uh, Z and third E is equal to C times B and uh, <coughs> so the magnitude of the electric field is equal to the speed of light times the magnitude of the magnetic field and again this is in, again one of the many approximations we're going to use in optics is that I'm going to consider m almost entirely the electric field vector only and this, if you like, is a good reason for doing that. Except for certain spa special magnetic materials, it's the interaction of the electric field vector with anything a light ray hits that is the important one, that we just drive, if you like, electrons somehow inside a material with the electric field. And being as in SI units, this is 3 times 10 to the 8, the electric field vector is indeed the dominant feature of the electromagnetic waves. So facts one to three can be summarised by nice concise equation. Again, it's very nice to have one equation that sums all these things up that B, it's usually written in this way, the different ways of writing it, is equal to 1 over C, K crossed E. 
And I think we're now up to equation uh, 12.7, where K is the propagation vector of the wave. And again, you'll have studied this in solid state physics, that if you like working in k-space, whenever you do diffraction type problems, you consider uh, the k-vector of the wave. So the k-vector in this particular case has only got an x component. So uh, if you like, in this, in this sort of case that we've got here, we've just got uh, the very simple case uh, that in this particular case, of course, k in general is a vector with components kx, ky, kz. But if you've got this nice plane wave case, k is just equal to kx. And we're looking at propagation along this one axis. So again, just to uh, summarize those uh, calculations, maybe just use this board uh, here. Let's... Uh, so, you know, when we were over in VO45, and I'm so short of board space, uh, I, I didn't make any actual notes as we were, as we were going along with this, but now uh, I'd like to do this. So, by analysing the situation from, let's call it, the side view, and that was illustrated in figure 51 of the course handout. We can show that E is equal to VB. So we looked along this axis, back along the Z axis, and then all the B field lines were pointing down into the plane and the E field was down vertically across the um, plane. And again, this is very similar to that situation that we studied. In terms of the, 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 the kind of concept, it was similar to the situation we studied with that sliding crossbar, which was also one of the um, problems that I set last Friday. In this case, we apply Faraday's law and we, as the wave moves through this Stokes loop, the important thing is this Stokes loop is thrown around the interface of the travelling wave so that out here the fields are zero and in here they've developed this finite value inside the wave front. And so the dB by d, the surface integral of, of, of B dot N is just B times L times this distance travelled and then when we take the time derivative we get BLV and when we went round this Stokes loop we found zero from this leg and this leg because the E field which is down the page is perpendicular to the displacement vector going round the Stokes loop this leg gave us zero precisely because there's no field there and this le leg the E field was parallel to the Stokes loop and so we got E times L. The L's cancel out, this is the line integral is EL and the uh, negative rate of change of flux on this side is BLV and we therefore got uh, this simple relationship or of course, and it's easier to make the comparison, E over B is V and again remember this is generally true even though we only analysed it in this simple geometry. Um, and by using, let's call it the top view, which was illustrated in figure 50 of the course handout, we, let's move this up a little, make a bit more, uh, we can show that we've got E is equal to, well, let's, uh, let's just do it. Uh, again, I analysed, rather than just write the result down, we can also look down this axis, 
And when we look down this axis, it's the E field lines that are going directly down from us. The B field lines are now across our vision. And so we analyse that from the point of view of the Ampere-Maxwell law, and that was illustrated here. Now, again, same argument, we've got only a contrib no, no contribution from these legs to this integral because the B field is perpendicular to the displacement, no contribution from this leg here because the B field hasn't arrived yet, and at this leg we've just got B times L because they're parallel to each other. But now in this case, this integral is equal to mu naught epsilon naught times the rate of change of the electric flux coming through this surface. The electric field is now the one into the plane. And so we have, again, by exactly the same argument, this side now gives us ELV, and again the Ls cancel, and we get B is mu naught epsilon naught EV, or similarly, E is equal to so, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I put it this way up here, but uh, uh, I'll try and keep to the same nomenclature. So E is equal to B over mu naught epsilon naught V. Or, of course, if I want to take, and probably the easiest way is now just to take this ratio, as I did this time, is 1 over mu naught epsilon naught V. And of course, when we put this together, we put these two things together, it's the same wave, just analysed from two different points of view. So the ratio of E to B is clearly the same thing. We get V is equal to 1 over mu naught epsilon naught V, or V squared is 1 over mu naught epsilon naught, or V is 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught, and uh, as required by, oops, thank you very much, I heard somebody say, as required by the rigorous derivation. So this one was a slightly more intuitive derivation, but it's also um, a good way of seeing that this relationship must be true from the, from the Maxwell equations. Here we've, if you like, explicitly applied first the Faraday's law to the, to the wave front, then we've applied the Ampere-Maxwell law to the wave front, and we get two different criteria for the relationship of the magnetic field strength to the electric field strength. And they give us, of course, what we got from the rigorous derivation, which is that the speed is 1 over mu naught uh, epsilon naught. Then last but not least, there was this point that I made um, at the end of the lecture. And if you like, this is now the principle of electromagnetic signalling, which again, we'll come back to more on the um, lecture on Monday is that if at time t equals zero, I, uh, this is the x-axis, because this is, again, refers to this geometry, a block of field is sent out when I shake the board upwards. However, if at a certain finite time, capital T later, having shaken the board up, I now shake it down and bring it to the same point, I send out now the B field instead of being this way, is this way. The E field, instead of being this way, is this way. It, I exactly send out. So it applies to either the B field or the E field. It doesn't matter which one I consider. If I shake the board in the opposite di or the sheet of charge in the opposite direction, I send out a block of field in the opposite sense. So principle of the Maxwell equations are linear equations. We always have superposition of solutions. It doesn't matter whether they're wave-like solutions or, you know, we're used to, like, you know, you start off, oh, here's a, a charge Q1 and here's a charge Q2. Might be negative, this one. There's another negative charge, Q3. And at some point, P, we add up the vector fields due to these three charges and add them by superposition to give the total electric field. 
This superposition applies equally to the dynamic fields. And so by superposition, everything up to here cancels out and we just get nothing. But this can never be cancelled out. This is both waves are travelling at the same speed. So we get a block of field that travels out from the source. And this is uh, incredibly, of course, technologically important. We just, at the origin, we shake a charge up and down and then this wave goes away at the speed of light. And, uh, and so that, you know, we now got into a completely new world of communication that we can transmit, we control how much we shake the board up and down, that gives us a certain shape of wave, and then off it goes as a block of field until it reaches an antenna somewhere else and gets absorbed, and then we turn it back into uh, information with an LCR circuit and amplify it. And we've got radios, televisions, computers, mobile phones, the internet, and so on. So this was you know, a, a pretty massive uh, leap forward. So, again, I'd like to make uh, a, a specific note on that because, again, it's such a massive uh, concept. Um, and so, um, let me just use this board over here, maybe, because uh, so I, I want to keep that free for some more view graphs. So, <coughs> the... Um, as shown in figure, I think that's 49 of the course handout, as shown in figure 49, the new effect nobody had thought of this before, the new effect that emerges from Maxwell's equations in free space is that long after all activity at the source has stopped the block of E fields and B fields continues it's just a uh, continues to travel through space at the speed c, which we know is, of course, the speed of light. So we have a completely new effect that was predicted from the Maxwell equations that these wave-like solutions would just head off to free space. And indeed, we now have a demonstration experiment. Are you ready? This, you may find hard to believe, was a state-of-the-art ghetto blaster when I was a student. This, is, yeah, this, this was really cool 30-odd 30, 30 years ago. Uh, now you kind of think, blimey, you can hardly lift the thing up you know, when it's filled with batteries. You know, this, is, this, this is a bit less sophisticated than an iPhone, let's put it this way. However, if you switch it on, and it's quite a while since I did, so let's, let's hope it still works. Thank you for your donation. That's why I'm oh. a crustacean. See, it's not even bothering him. It's not even bothering him. So as you can see, we now have the technology to transmit complete banalities over huge distances very, very quickly. Uh, but th 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 there's a point to this in, in the sense that this room is completely full of electromagnetic waves. Unless we were to subscribe... I mean, you've no idea what this would have done to people like 150 years ago. It's like, you know, somebody just flicks a little switch and, you know, there's, a, there's an entire <laughs> orchestra in a box or... Oh, my God. 
or some rubbish pop music or whatever. But it, 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 what's the, this room is full of electromagnetic waves. This, this box isn't making them, but they're driving the electrons up and down in this aerial. And then, well, you've done, most of you have studied LCR circuits to some extent. We then turn that into, you know, we have resonance circuits, LCR circuits. And, um, and then, again, we've got the vibrations by Faraday's law. We can then make something vibrate mechanically from the electrical oscillations, and we can make the air vibrate and send out sound waves at the other end. So 300 kilometres away, down in London, uh, this, is, this is just tuned in to BBC Radio 2, 300 kilometres away, down in London, or 3 times 10 to the 5 metres away, down in London, so 3 times 10 to the 5 metres are being travelled at 3 times 10 to the 8 metres a second. So 10 to the minus 3 seconds ago, or about a millisecond ago, somebody was chatting in a studio in London, and here in York, we've got a voice. And the fact that there's a time delay of a millisecond doesn't make much difference to us. Um, you know, it's still just as banal, you know, a millisecond later. But, the, the, you know, the point is that also, which I'll be coming to with the electromagnetic signalling, is that uh, any, there's a complete reciprocal relationship between the source and the receiver. And it's just in London, there's a great big antenna, and people at the other end, their voices are making some electrical circuit oscillate. Then that sends off the electromagnetic waves, and the waves make this oscillate, and we do a reciprocal thing at the other end. Of course, you need a much bigger antenna with a lot more power to send the wave from London. And, um, the, but, you know, the principle is there. Now, where we come to the difficult bit on, on Monday is, of course, now the radiation is spreading out in three di dimensions, yeah? By conservation of energy, if this is the source in London, the, the, the energy is spreading out in 3D. But it's not spreading out perfectly spherically symmetrically. Because if you think, let's say, for example, electrons just being driven like that, well, of course, the E-field, this is general to the Maxwell equations, the E-field has got to be perpendicular. So if the wave is heading out towards you like that, the E-field has got to be perpendicular. Yeah? But if I'm at some angle like that, the E-field is also like this, and if I'm directly above the aerial, I shall try not to poke my eye out at this point, and I look down like that, and the direction of propagation is like this, then I look down on the projection, I don't actually get any energy radiated up through the top. Most of the energy comes out in the equatorial plane, lesser and lesser energy comes out as I go towards the pole, and at this point, there's no E field at all because the e, the driving charge here can't be parallel. You've got an E field that's oscillating in that sense, and if the direction of propagation is upwards, then they'd be parallel to each other, and that's against the Maxwell equations. The E field, if I look at this as the propagation direction, the E field has to be in that way, but if I've driven the charge up and down, the E field isn't in that direction. It's got no component in this sense. So it's a more different, it's called dipole radiation and it's more, it's more difficult and we're only going to treat, when we do optics, we're going to do only the, um, the plane waves because they're much more uh, straightforward to deal with. Okay, we've got um, about five or ten minutes and I'd like to use that rather than plough on to sort of congratulate you. Well done, you've climbed K2. Let's just kind of have a look at the view. If you, uh, if you like, you can just you know, nod off at this point. But um, it does have some relevance to what we're going to do. Well, first of all, when I've referred to light, we haven't said anything at all about the frequency of the wave. This applies to any frequency or any wavelength whatsoever. Certainly, the speed of light is constant. But let's say we just multiply the frequency in hertz by the wavelength in meters. There are lots of ways of making that combination and getting 3 times 10 to the 8 meters a second. And this is taken from a rather old book, and it's a bit, a bit grainy, is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And um, again, I've, I've put this up, although it's just sort of chit-chat, uh, there's some important points in this. First of all, I've coloured in here, we are at about 10 to the 15 hertz. Remember, we've always got C is 3 times 10 to the 8 metres per second. Now, we know that uh, the visible spectrum runs from about 400 nanometers, which is red, to about 700 nanometers, excuse me, red, uh, blue at this end of the spectrum, and green, let's say, at 600. So when it so happens, our eyes are extremely sensitive to this bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. But this is on a log scale, this spectrum. And so there are now a lot of other phenomena that are within our grasp, thanks to this unification theory. And when we do optics, we're going to do optics which actually won't really apply down this way. Now, the reason for this, this is the vacuum ultraviolet. This is soft X-rays, this is hard X-rays and gamma rays, and these are cosmic rays and gamma rays. So although the Maxwell equations are part of the theory of everything, we certainly are not in this course able to cope with the idea that the radiation arrives in quantized lumps. And the more short the wavelength gets, each individual lump is carrying a lot of energy. So corresponding to this wavelength range, as I say, order of magnitude, we're at 10 to the 13 hertz. I mean, that's still a lot of oscillations per second. But when you get down to these cosmic rays, you're looking at 10 to the 23 hertz. And when you're at 10 to the 23 hertz, the individual photons themselves are carrying so much energy that when we detect them, we're sensitive, if you like, to the lumpiness of the radiation. And that is beyond the scope of this course. So, you know, we can't do everything all at one go. We're not doing quantum electrodynamics. And we won't be able to deal with where the, a regime, which is where the individual photons carry a lot of energy. We're assuming that the intensity of the wave is just going as its square of its amplitude and that we have classical electromagnetic waves. So, uh, of course, there are a lot of, uh, of phenomena, particularly when we go down this way, that we won't, we won't be able to understand the photoelectric effect. And indeed, that was why it was such a shock to classical physics, because you think if you shine lots of red light rather than just a little bit of blue light, you'd be able to eject photons from a, uh, so, sorry, electrons from a surface, but you can't because the energy arises in lumps and the lump has got to exceed the work function. Well, we can't go there. However, we have opened up a lot of stuff at this end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's keep going down. Now, the intermediate infrared, the far infrared, we're going to have a wonderful theory of heat radiation come out of this. Submillimeter waves, millimeter waves. We're now getting round to here. You'll see it's also in temperature. Uh, we're down there. We're getting down to the cosmic microwave background radiation. We're opening up now completely understanding radio astronomy, where again these are huge separations now between the wave fronts. They are behaving classically, and of course ultra high frequency radar, TV very high frequency, TV, FM radio, high frequency, AM radio, medium frequency, right down to audio and power frequencies. So the electromagnetic wave theory is opening up an enormous new range of phenomena. And in a lot of the stuff on, that I'll talk about in optics, I'll say light, because that's much quicker to say than electromagnetic wave. It's also a lot easier to say than to write on a blackboard. So, but remember, when we're doing optics, we'll also be looking, when we do interference and diffraction of light waves with this theory, it will apply to like having two radio masts next to each other. How do their... Uh, <coughs> electromagnetic waves interfere with each other, and so on. So we've opened up this completely new uh, phenomenon. Again, some people get a, a bit confused. I, I put on the, 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 
the, uh, run, I mean, actually, Radio 2 AM is broadcasting on 247 metres, but, you know, it's just an order of magnitude calculation. Let's call it 300. So, given that C is equal to lambda times F, then we've got a frequency of about a megahertz. And you can't think, well, wait a minute, my hearing range is, say, from 20 to 20 kilohertz. Yours is probably a bit wider than mine because you're younger. But, uh, of course, you think, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm hearing in this range, uh, the frequency is being broadcast in the megahertz. But this is amplitude modulation of the wave, is that, you see, this is the carrier wave. This is the carrier wave, you know, the carrier wave is this oscillation here in the megahertz region, which we certainly wouldn't hear. But I modulate the amplitude, AM, amplitude modulation. So I make this, I make a slight extra bit of wave here, and then a slight extra extra bit here, and so on. And so when I modulate the amplitude in this way, this carries effectively a much longer wavelength wave, which is the one that we actually hear. Uh, well, we don't even hear that. Of course, we have to turn the electromagnetic wave into uh, an acoustic vibe. First into, we drive the electrons in the circuit at that frequency, and then we turn that into a sound wave. It's indirect. And of course, you can achieve the same effect by wobbling the wave you can f modulate the frequency. And if you like, what we, what, what we transmit are the carrier wave is at quite a high frequency, but the modulation, whether we shake the wave or modulate it in this sense, is what gives us the information. And uh, we'll come back to that a bit. So, again, um, just to say two, this was a slightly deeper reason. You know, I introduced the vector potential as having a, a very convenient way of calculating magnetic fields, it's got a much deeper significance because exactly that Lorentz gauge, Lorentz noticed a very, this is taken from Feynman, remarkable and curious thing when he made these substitutions. This was originally discovered, excuse me, as the AX, AY, AZ and phi form what's called a four vector. In other words, they transform into each other in this very particular way, and then the abstraction was made further. Well, the space and time coordinates transform into each other in this same very particular way. And you had the development in the 18th, sadly, after Maxwell's death, also, it was sad, Hertz didn't do the first demonstration of radio waves till the late 1880s. It was 1887, 1888, long after Maxwell's uh, untimely death in 1879. But Lorentz recognised that this set of substitutions left the Maxwell equations invariant. Now, Newtonian mechanics had been dominating physics or science for um, 200 years. And for about 20 years, all the top scientists were trying to work out what is wrong with the Maxwell equations because they obey this funny transform instead of the Galilean transformation. And then in 1905, a rather brilliant scientist uh, called Albert Einstein, and the, the clue, this we now call the special relativity paper, but the clue to the, what it was all about is in the title, On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. And Einstein took the massive leap forward and said, no, it's not these that are wrong, it's this. The Galilean transformation is wrong and that mechanics should therefore obey the Lorentz transform. And so that was, uh, again the absolutely massive leap forward. So, you know, like, when we do modern um, sort of uh, stuff, you know, you see on the telly, it's sort of made out, oh, you know, this patent clerk in Zurich got on a train and was going past the embankment and thought, oh, I wonder what it'd be like if I was going past the embankment at the speed of light. Uh, well, it wasn't quite that simple. Scientists have been grappling for 20 years with this problem of the discrepancy between the transformation of electrodynamics and the transformation of Newtonian mechanics. It was Maxwell who was right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
get, get ready for a, a difficult one on Monday, but after that, 